So this next session is something that kind of was um, a little bit of a throwback in my life. I worked in the film industry for about 15 years, and I used to watch a very, uh, a very interesting show called Inside the Actor's Studio. And one of the things I loved about it was that it was this beautiful, candid kind of conversation between um, an incredible interviewer and an incredible guest. And after, year, after last year having the opportunity to work with Dr. Tuxin, um, I was like, we're doing inside the digital health studio. So it's a little bit of a play on that. And the, the, the contact is, um, it's a little bit more than a fireside chat. So, you know, very interesting questions, hopefully maybe some provocative discussions. And I'd like to introduce you first to our moderator, our leader of this, this session, and his name is Paul Slavin. Paul Slavin is Senior Vice President and General Manager of Everyday Health. He is responsible for the video and global operations. He leads strategy, delivery, and execution of the news organization and innovative video channels for Everyday Health portfolio, prestigious sites. That includes Recipe Rehab and its original YouTube programming. His, uh, his previous work was with ABC News, so I'm sure you've seen him many, many times interviewing a lot of big people. So with that, I'm gonna let them take over and enjoy. Thank you. It's a real honor to be up here with somebody as esteemed as Dr. Tuxin. Um, he is the EVP and Chief Medical um, Affairs Officer for United Health Group. He is trained extensively at Howard, Georgetown, the University of Pennsylvania. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine. I could go on. Uh, he's an author, most recent book, Doctor in the Mirror. Um, and at United Health, uh, he works with business units to improve quality and efficiency. But mostly what he is is a superb, deep thinker about all things medical. Um, and there's a lot of deep thinking that needs to be had in this, this realm because we are, in my opinion, uh, facing a catastrophe of preventable diseases and um, other things which are affecting our populations. So I wanted to start sort of seriously um, because I think this is a serious subject. And I'd also like it if you all would just interrupt as you see fit. It's a little hard for me to see, but if you'd like to interject, please do. Raise your hands, we'll have some time afterwards for you all to ask questions. But I wanted to start with something that you've already said, and that's we are in deep trouble. Do you still feel that way? And if so, why? And if not, what are you seeing that's actually changing the landscape? I think that um, the reason that this digital health summit and the reason that health has to be forefronted in the Consumer Electronics Show is because we need every one of you and the people that you engage recruited uh, to this fight that is essentially a fight for the future of, of our nation. And, and I know that that is a very serious comment. If you really think about what's happening in America today, the biggest challenge, threat that we have is this escalation in healthcare costs. If you read any of the political discourse that is going on now, you see that the growth in our Medicare expenditures, what's happening in Social Security, all of those kinds of discretionary programs, which more and more and more Americans are reliant upon, these entitlement programs. Uh, there is nowhere to go to get any more money for, for those services. More immediately and more to home at the state level, if you look at what's happening in our states, it's the Medicaid budgets that are bankrupting um, our states, and there are very few states that are unscathed from either the economic consequences of providing health care to their people or the health care costs for state, and employ, uh, state employees. If you look at what's happening to business, both at the large corporate level, but probably more immediately at the small business level, there's not a dime more that they can go. And so there is this huge problem of a runaway freight train of costs which this society can no longer afford any more of. Commiserate with that is a freight train running head on to those realities, which is what you say in your opening comments, which is this elevation of preventable chronic illness. 
the number of Americans who are becoming sick and who are living with chronic illness, along with the aging, but I really want to focus more on the chronic illness than the aging, the number of people that are getting ill and are being ill earlier in their lives who will require extraordinary expensive medical care is astronomical. And so you've got this cost runaway train running head on into a preventable chronic illness train. And at the end of the day, our society is going to have to make some very painful choices and decisions within the context of a political discourse that is not prepared for that conversation. So to conclude this point of, of where I, I like your question, if we do not recruit some very smart people who know how to do things that we've never been able to successfully do in healthcare before, we are going to be in deep doo-doo. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, in deep trouble. Um, but that being said, I would much rather be optimistic than pessimistic about the future of this nation. But let me underline a point here, because here we are at the Digital Health Summit, and we saw these wonderful technologies that people are utilizing to improve health care, and you read about it in the papers all the time, or online, or however people get their information these days. Um, and there's this tremendous focus on medicalizing problems and using technology to solve problems, and we'll get to that. But it seems to me what you're saying is, is this is a function of public policy more than it is a function of medicine. It's a function of overeating, of overweight, of, of cigarette-borne diseases, things which are preventable, things which are lifestyle-related. Um, and it's not just the United States. Let me throw out a, a fact that I just learned. There are 100 million diabetics in China, and they expect that number to rise to 300 million by 2020. There will be more diabetics in China than there are almost Americans in this country. So this is a global problem which will have global consequences. So before we get to the role of technology and how it can help, what is the role of media, of the public health system, of medical professionals, what is the role in trying to combat the tsunami, as you yeah. characterize it, of preventable disease? Well, I would, I, would, I would say first in terms of the premise of your question, you made a, a dichotomy. You say that and, and your, 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 the formulation of that was um, that there's policy, public policy issues, and then there's the medicalization. I would say that the, 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 a third ingredient needs to be put into that mix, which is um, the use of technology that's not medical, but technology that is wellness, fitness, health promoting, and those kinds of things. But, 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 but in terms of your point, um, as you make this observation about China, you know, China's got 100 million diabetics. Don't forget that in the United States, you've got 100 million people with either diabetes or pre-diabetes right now in America. So think about the magnitude of that. By the time that we get to 2020, it'll be $500 billion of expenditures just on diabetes. But, to this, but, the, but the point of your question, Paul, which is good, is it what is the role of, of, and what you sort of describe is the reality of a multidisciplinary, integrated set of solutions that include what happens at the level of community life. How do we live our lives in the context of community? The geographical community for the moment, the space in which we live. If you think carefully, as you've said, the etiology, the causation of disease very much arises out of the context of, of, of living life, where we live, how we go to work, uh, those sorts of engagements. I used to be the health commissioner for the District of Columbia. My job was to be the epidemiologist, the scorekeeper. So many cases of this, so many of that, so many people died of this, so many died of that. When you keep score and you look back at cause, you do find that you're standing at the intersection of all the crossroads of our society. The public health environment, this ideological cause, is actually the summation, the representation, the end result of a variety of things that are very much at the level of community life. So clearly, policy and, and community dynamics are very important. Secondly, you mentioned the role of the, of the medical care system. We are in the process now of turning medical care on its ear. And instead of trying to provide 
the incentives that stimulate an overwhelming introduction of a medical army, the medicalization of these problems, we are now trying to turn a battleship, and we're very early in that process, to incentivizing the delivery system to think about being a part of the prevention solution. That is hard for them because they're not trained that way, they don't have the tools to engage in that way, um, and quite frankly, their re reimbursement isn't that way, and their level of intellectual respect isn't tied to prevention. It's much more tied to the doing of things. So they have to be a part of it. But in addition to those forces, I would urge that then there are other players that need to be in. The individual now is much more the driver and has to be the driver of what occurs. And that means that if they're going to be successful, people who are in this room are going to have to be the ones to help them to move beyond rhetoric, desire to actual behavioral change. And that's where the art form and that's where the hard work has to occur. Both of us are old enough to remember the 1990s when Dr. Kessler and a whole bunch of other advocates went after cigarettes and successfully changed the dynamic and changed the conversation around cigarettes after many, many years. In that um, effort with a lot of legal activity as well, I, cigarette smoking became, for many people, anathema. It became something that wasn't good to do, it wasn't sexy to do. Now, there are a lot of people who are trying to change that now, but I think that was very successful. Can we legitimately change, do you expect us to change behavior if the primary factor, overeating, eating poorly, those kinds of, of, um, of factors, if, if we consider that to be okay, if we have huge industries devoted to essentially, some would suggest, addicting populations to high fat, high salt, high sugar foods, what is, again, what is the role of the medical community, of the insurance community in trying to alter general perceptions? The tobacco, example is a good one in that it depends, you can look at it as glass half empty, glass half full. Make no mistake, we made great progress in this country through the use of regulation, laws, and social determinants, social sense of what's acceptable. I mean, can you imagine now going into a restaurant or a bar and coming out and having to take your clothes to the cleaners because they stink? I mean, it just would be like odd, you know? I mean, it would be like, how did, how it could it be the norm that somebody could make the air that I breathe, you know, uh, raggedy? So, technical term. Um, so we changed that. You're absolutely right. That was the good news. And it came down. Bad news. 21% of the American people still smoke tobacco. 1,000 kids today will become addicted to tobacco today. 4,000 kids will start their first cigarette today. So the, the effort is we certainly brought that curve down, but we're at a very chronic baseline, and we continue to recruit more and more people. So there's lots and lots of work that has to, to go there. So be excited about the appropriate role of regulation. Be excited about the, the ability to change social dynamic. So just like I started out by saying how important it was for geographical community, what encourages people like me as I come to CES is the importance of social community. I'm very much aware now of the, of the an elevated importance of a community of people that are not in a geographical space, but in some kind of a virtual space. And maybe we'll come back to that. But at the end of it, I think that, that, that if any of the tools that we are excited about will be useful, it will only be because people have made a personal decision for whatever reason to change their life for whatever reason. That reason may be because we are now a segment of America saying, I really do like to be healthy. I like to do things. Guess what? 26% of Americans get no exercise whatsoever other than going to work. Can you define what no exercise means? Think All they do is get up and go to work. Right, that's it. They, they walk to the car, get in the car, that's it. They're get up, go to work, go They don't walk up the home. steps, they don't do anything. 26%. Right. Now, I don't, do, I don't know those people. The people I know are working out, running, doing stuff, but there's 26% of the people. I know so, one, one okay, sitting well, over there. But the point I'm getting to is, 
I mean, listen, I did, and I did not attack not, the audience. He's not, he, he's not paying attention either. 26 <laughs> But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to drive to is that if you do not sort of make the choice that you want to use the tools, the tools don't become very useful. Now, having said that, the tools provide an exciting opportunity to get people to do things in their best interest because it is now integrated in, it makes doing the right thing the easy thing. That's exciting. And then third is there is now a whole new set of financial incentives that are going to push people because as I described that cost problem and who can't pay any more money, the only where you're gonna get new money in healthcare is going to be getting it from individuals. The individual is on the hook now for paying more and more out-of-pocket costs, for whether it's insurance or for devices or whatever it may be. If the individual has a financial stake in the game, believe me, they're going to get, you know, we're going to get their attention. And so those things may motivate. But, but the premise of your question is very important. Unless you are willing or excited to use the tools, the tools won't work. So let's go to something you said you'd talk a little bit more about. How do we start at the broadest area, which is getting the community to accept this? It's, and, and I think you may have been talking about something a little different than what I was referring to, but the community has to accept that cigarettes are bad. And even then, 21% of the people will continue to smoke. Um, and I think that's because we're giving mixed signals in the media and we give mixed signals in allowing companies to create cigarettes. Um, but how do we engage the community? How do we get people to have this personal sense of responsibility? I understand financial incentive. So that they will then go out and search out the tools, and then we can move to the tools. Because you can leave as many hammers out as you want, but if somebody doesn't want to build a house, they're just going to sit there. I think first, uh, what, one of the things that I've been fortunate to do is we, we, we do something called America's Health Rankings. And you can go online and check it out. It's actually a pretty interesting set of data. It's called, you go to americashealthrankings.org, all one word, America's Health Rankings. And what we, we release it every December. And it, it's the story, it's all those stories you read in the newspaper, USA Today had the whole front page on it uh, in December, which ranks the states by overall healthiness. What you can do by ranking states and overall healthiness is to actually have a conversation with America about epidemiology. You can actually say, hey, let me tell you what's going on. The role of data is very interesting when you use it to say, you can, you can actually, I, and I, I, they, I, they strap me in a room, and I, and I just go on and do television satellite tours from like 5 a.m. to you know, like night. And, and, and I have, you know, I drive time Seattle with Bob and Ray, right? And you can go and say to Bob and Ray, let me tell you about the health of Washington. And then, and they get very excited, and they get very concerned, and then they ask, what can we do? So I think first is getting good data that gives you a sense of where you are as a community. Second then is to be able to give people some sense of the impact of that. If you do not change your behavior, you will pay for all of these preventable hospitalizations, and this is what it will mean to you in terms of your pocketbook, your company's bottom line, your state government's budget, and so forth and so on. So there's a sense of cause and effect that you can start to have that conversation. Third is you can then have the conversation about your children, because people are highly motivated about their kids. When you tell folks what the obesity rate is for their children, you begin to get their attention, not about their life, but about their kid's life. And then that translates into their life. So there are triggers that you can have. But then at the end of it, which is also the key thing is, all right, you got my attention, what can I do? And that becomes where you got them. If you can then step in and say, let me give you some suggestions, some solutions of things that work, uh, then, then, then you have a chance. But raising the alarm is absolutely the first step, but it's obviously necessary but not sufficient. But we've been raising the alarm for some time now, and I don't want to put you on the spot by asking you what's the increase in the rate of childhood obesity. I mean, if you know that, that's great, but I know it's going up. It's not going down. And we've been talking about this and talking about this, and yet it still continues to go up. So I hear all the things that you're saying. I don't disagree with you. It feels as if there's a, a, a tipping point, although the tipping point feels as if we've been there for, for quite some time. What pushes us over the edge? Is, is it the tsunami of data? Is it the data that's becoming available both from a broad-based population point of view or just an individual point of view? Is that enough, or do we just have to start hitting people over the head with sticks 
financially speaking? And is there the political will to do that? Because I don't, I'm not sure if I see that exactly. So I, you catch me, you know, schizophrenic in terms of. There's um, medicine for that. <laughs> of whether you're you know, sort of optimistic or pessimistic. Um, I am concerned and, and, and very worried because of the premise of your question. Look, look folks, these numbers aren't turning around and they are getting worse. There are, at least there was a set of recent reports that have a glimmer of news that suggests that maybe the childhood obesity uh, epidemic or statistics in a few environments may start to be slowing. Okay, how much slowing, how fast, will this be sustainable? Um, uh, I, I would say to you that it's, it's, it's gonna be hard for me to sort of say that this is gonna be a big trend that's gonna put enough brakes on this fast moving train uh, uh, to be able to be commiserate with the level of problem. So I'm, I'm saying to you that no, I'm not overly optimistic that left to its own devices that we're going to see a good, everything doesn't always turn out to be terrific. I mean, the Calvary doesn't always ride in, and the movie ends with the, with the sun over the horizon. I mean, this may be a time where we are actually in for a very long, bad ride. Now, I'm a physician. In the face of that, do I get then pessimistic and go home? Or do I get more energized and say, look, I gotta be at CES. I gotta find some more people. We gotta get more people engaged. We gotta figure out a way to harness a much better, higher power. When, when, you, when you think about the health system before the digital revolution in health came along, what did we do? Here's our brochure, just say no. Well, of course that doesn't work. It's so impersonal, so, so, so bland, so unfocused, so non-individualized. If you go to the care delivery system, the care delivery system looks at you and says, hey, we are the institution, you've gotta to learn to fit into our model. We don't change for you. We're not focused on you, we're focused on us. So that's the way it has been. Uh, the way it's been is no immediate feedback on whether you've started to make an intervention and got immediate gratification. No, it's always delayed gratification. Obesity slips up on you over time. All of a sudden, you know, it's like the, the obesity virus jumped up on you and you try to button up your pants and all of a sudden, God, I'm obese. It happens over time, it's very subtle, it's very insidious. So my point being is that we've not had the tools that are being developed today. So I guess I would just sort of say to your point, look folks, this is not something that in and of itself is just going to be a tipping point. Left to its own devices, this is not going to turn out well. And so yes, there will have to be financial incentives. There will no question that you're gonna to have to make folks have skin in the game economically, but, and that's, a, that's an approach. There's no question you're gonna have to hit the delivery system in the head with a hammer and make them have a different set of orientation, a different set of incentives, and align the financial incentives for the individual with the financial incentives for the delivery system. You gotta smash those together and make them one. You've gotta take the financial incentives for the manufacturers and the innovators. You gotta take their incentives, smash it in, and align it with those other two incentives. So everybody's talking the same. You gotta have the insurers have the same incentives that, that all the rest do, and you gotta stitch that together. But I just could keep coming back to, though, at the end of the day, I would prefer that we look at this not so much from the hammer, but look at it much more from the carrot. I like what's going on in terms of the ability to engage people, not only with the technology and the tools, but to engage people with data. This is the final moment when, we, when health starts looking like other industries. We start now being big data and actually having the commiserate analytics to make sense out of that big data and then turn that data into personally relevant uh, information and then action steps and then combine that with the tools and then on down the line. So it just means that if we're gonna be able to solve this, you gotta put all those things together and anybody that wants to look at it as if you got one magic bullet, that's stupid. You gotta align all the bullets and shoot them all at the same time. And I think that's the opportunity. So let's look at that a little bit more. How do we give people access to personally appropriate health care that drives up quality but either keeps costs flat or drives them down? So you first then start with 
And what I like is exciting is being able to put the databases, the data together. So we now take, for example, on, on, you can take your medical claims data, pharmacy data, laboratory data, and already that data is, you can stitch that data together and have a conversation. You can tell a novel about Mrs. Jones. Okay, I know Mrs. Jones is a 55-year-old African-American woman with diabetes and congestive heart failure. I know that she should have gotten a mammogram. I know she didn't get it. I now can take that information and reach out to her and say, excuse me, Mrs. Jones, you need to get a mammogram. I know that she still didn't get it. I send out another note. She still didn't get it. Now I pick up the phone and call her, Mrs. Jones, you need to get a mammogram. I then tell her doc something about her and have the doc in the conversation. Now you start moving. OK, so that was where we are today. So then you can start to say, now I've got data that comes from their health screenings, from her health risk assessment. I have data that comes from mobile apps. I have data that can come from an EMR, from a health information exchange. I have data that comes from biometry and from care coordination, care management. And there are people, finally, in healthcare who know how to take those data streams and stitch them together and have another level of conversation about Mrs. Jones. And then I can take that data and do something that other industries have long done and say, what do I know about Mrs. Jones as a consumer? How does she think about health? How engaged is she? What dissemination vehicles does she want to receive her information? And when does she want to receive it? And start now to push that information to her in a way that's personally appropriate. Secondly, I can take the data around her care delivery system. And I can now understand the quality of the care that she received and analyze it against best scientific evidence. I can also take the cost of the care that she received and analyze it against the community norms in that environment. I can look at how the clinical system used the hospital, how they used imaging procedure facilities, take all of that information, analyze it, and then I can make it and do today transparent to the individual. Dear person, here is the quality of the doctors and the hospitals in your environment. Here is the cost by procedure, and I can tell you in your health plan depending on what kind of benefit you have, how much you have to pay out of pocket, and make that transparent to everyone. So you take both ends of those kinds of data streams, put those two together, you start to get to a real opportunity of personally appropriate choices where you feel, identify risks, identify gaps in care, close those gaps, you can identify best quality, lowest cost, and then refer people into those places so you start to move the market to better quality, better performers, then you take all of that together and then keep helping people to become sophisticated in using those tools. And I ended with that, question, that, that issue because that worries me. How to help people become sophisticated to be able to use those tools. But you're talking about coming at this after the person has the disease. After Mrs. Jones is diabetic after she's got chronic heart disease or congestion. Is it enough? Are we going to be able to get ourselves out of this if we just end up treating disease? Or do we have to deal with it before it becomes an epidemic? And if so, where are the data points for that? How do you, how do you utilize big data in order to take someone who is slim and athletic when they're 21 and obese and you know, chronically ill when they're 35? So the very few things that are certain in this world, one that I know is, it is not possible to medicalize your way out of this problem. So it has to be that you are turning these tools into the front end prevention side. So when I mentioned to you that you know something about how Mrs. Jones thinks, and you also understand her risks for illness, those are the things that give you the intervenable opportunities. And then when you know what level of engagement she is in terms of willing to make choices and decisions, whether she's sick or before she is sick, then you can begin to engage with her. What I think your question opens up, Paul, and it's a very good one, is the challenge that this audience will have with its products and services. And that is, when does something become a pure wellness prevention, fitness, health enhancing tool, and when does it become 
a tool within the, 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 the healthcare clinical armamentarian to prevent prevention that then has to be stipulated under certain kinds of stringent regulations and, 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 and a much higher bar for value determination. But maybe that's a question we'll come back to. But my point being, though, is I completely accept your point, and I'm glad you gave me a chance to be even more emphatic about the notion that those data assets that I talked about were not merely, I did not intend for them to be merely described as clinical, but, in, in, but also from the very beginning of, of prevention. So let me go against your character and ask you four questions, and I'd like just a yes or a no. <laughs> oh, that'll be easy. <laughs> Can technology save us? <laughs> no. Can government save us? No. Can medicine save us? No. Can we save ourselves? The answer is yes. The, now you can go on. Can Sorry. I say Yeah, now you can go on. In other words, I just want to reemphasize the, the, the thought. And, and I don't want to frustrate you with this thought, because I don't, I don't, you know, the enemy of the good is the perfect. Let's don't try to over-engineer things. Don't make things more complex than they need to be. Let's just get it going. Let's keep moving. So anyone in here from the investment world that has to stimulate and make capital available for change, I'm with you. I love you all to death. So let not burden you with overwhelming expectations and so forth and so forth. So having said all of those things, look, folks, there ain't no magic bullets. There's no one thing anywhere that's going to get us out of this mess. What I'm saying is this is a time and an environment where all the tools have to be marshaled and they have to work together. Government has a role. You know, medical care has a role. We have a role. But we as individuals have such an enormous amount of say what happens, absolutely. But you know what, folks? People need help. They can't do this by the And you can't just sort of go and say, OK, tell you what, the reason that you're sick is because you suck. <laughs> you don't deserve. I, let me tell you, I have lived my life and tried to provide health care in a large variety of parts of America and in most of my career in the inner cities all across this country. And I'll tell you, the public policy discourse can evolve very quickly. I've seen it for the poor, and you can definitely see it now that you start to get to these problems around the federal budget and taxes going up or not for everybody. And, and what are they going to do with the, uh, with the cliff and the sequestration and how they're going to figure out how to handle that, which is a conversation they push back for, what, two months? Well, guess what? The whole conversation is going to devolve ultimately to around, hey, it's on you, buddy. Lots of luck. And I don't think you can just turn it over and say, OK, whether you live or die is up to your choices. You, hope you make it. <laughs> so I don't want to put it all on the person. We're going to have to help people to be able to act in their best self-interest, while at the same time, let me quickly emphasize before I get yelled at, yes, I believe in personal responsibility. You're doggone right I do. So let's take the last few minutes, open it up to the audience, see if you guys have anything you'd like to add. Um, one thing I'd like to ask the audience is, and, I, and I'm always often surprised by the answers, do you realize how much trouble this country is in? Do you realize that the road that we are traveling down and the speed with which we are traveling down that road? Um, I found your answers incredibly instructive to the yes, no questions, uh, because it really does indicate that the problem is deeply complex highly social, and not something that, that there's going to be a magic bullet for. We are not going to say we're going to go to the moon in nine years and get there. This is going to take a tremendous community-wide effort to solve. So with that, I can't see if there's anyone standing or not. There is. There is. Uh, good morning. Uh, Dr. Tuxin, I want to thank you for your, your passion and your knowledge. Um, we've mentioned everything, health, technology, business, media. Um, I'd like to get your comments on where spirituality fits into this. Boy, I love that. That is a great question. Thank you so yeah. much for that. If you, two, two dimensions I want to take that. Um, first is to the, to the obvious point that I think that you're trying to get us to, which is a sense that people who do have a strong spiritual life um, have a much more receptive, uh, fertile ground with which to implant uh, good tools and good information uh, to change behavior. If you have a sense of positivism already about your sense of, of, of the world and your place in it, 
if you already have a certain sense of optimism that comes from your spirituality, uh, what a wonderful set of, of forces to be able to work with to transform that innate desire for, for, for honoring your creator and your place in the world and your connection between other human beings and, and all of those things. That is a really fertile ground to be able to, to play with and work with. So I'm really, really excited. The second place, though, that may not have been as obvious to where you were is it comes back to Paul's sort of questions in the beginning around um, the community environment in which we have to sort of affect and transform into health and healing environments. The role of church ought to be a resource that is much better used. The church is a fundamental community-based organization. It is a place where people come for positive things. Can, we, can you imagine anybody lighting up a cigarette in the middle of the sanctuary? It's just, it's an, it's an antithetical thought. How do we then transform what happens in that environment for all of those people? And then how do we transform the community around church so that it becomes the nidus for transmitting information, the nidus for doing screening, the nidus for using consumer digital health tools in a way that gets people more engaged? The problem has been is that we have not been able to get the church community to sustain at scale interventions for health and life. They get at it, they go at it for a minute, then they get distracted and they go wandering off into something else, then you gotta pull them back. It's very hard to crack the church uh, environment and it's one of the things that I hope that we can find a better way to do because they are key to this puzzle. So I really appreciate your question. Another question over there. Thanks for that answer. Um, in the world of auto insurance, you can put a device on your car, and if you drive better, your rates will go down. Progressive insurance does this. How can you see that applying to health care and people conforming to what the health care uh, insurer would say, the payer, is a healthier lifestyle? So great, great question. So what you're seeing now in the, in the insurance marketplace, the most increasingly used or sold products in health insurance today are what's called consumer directive health plans, where the consumer has skin in the game uh, around their behavior. And what you are also seeing then is, uh, as a companion to that, is that if you act in certain responsible ways, you lower your blood pressure, you stop smoking cigarettes, you deal with your screenings for colonoscopies, and so forth. If you do these things, and we can capture and record that you've done it, your premiums come down. So there's a clear financial incentive, and the, our enlightened employers in America are catching on to that as being a value added that gives them an ROI worth implementing those things. Now, what you open up the door for, though, is the next step. I get really excited that you know, 13,500 mobile apps for health you know, today, terrific. How many get used? Oh, then you get sad. What we've got to do now is to engage the employers in providing some incentives for people to actually use the apps that then allow them to achieve the goals of the incentives of the health plan. So we've got to try to get some more incentives for people to have a better adoption of those tools. And that becomes one of the sort of elements, I think, in the tipping point. But just like with the cars, as you said, healthcare is finally catching up there. And it is, uh, I think, an inevitable movement. Now, the only other part of that, though, and I want this because of, of you at CES to sort of understand. Good ideas are only that, good ideas. Good ideas have to show economic value if we're going to get the employer community to write the checks. So there is a discipline here. There is a bar that is very high and very clear. Already our employers are already at the max of what they can pay for health care. They're already in a tough global environment. They need to know that what you make and that what you're excited about can actually produce value. So that becomes a, a, a real uh, part of it as well. Go ahead. Yes. Dr. Tusen, uh, Dr. Bettina Experton, founder and CEO of Humetrics. 
I'll thank you for your compelling remarks, and especially as a physician, I cared about the point you made about individual responsibility. In the area of national policies, this is called patient engagement, which has been translated in part by the Blue Button Initiative for patient consumer to directly access their health record online from their payers. And I know that United has embraced that policy. 28 million United members can now download a Blue Button record to share it. Uh, with their physician. Can you expand on the role of such an initiative and United role in having that in initiative be in fact used by patients? Thank you very much for that and, I'm, and I hope that everybody will, if you are not familiar with the Blue Button Initiative, uh, spearheaded by great places like the Veterans Administration and others at HHS, uh, you should check it out. But essentially what it does is to make it very easy for patients to be able to access uh, information. Um, and, and that becomes the key. And so uh, I, I won't have time because of there, if you can try to come over to our booth, which is in the south uh, exhibit area, south, south. we've kind of got examples of all that stuff there. And we can sort of take you through it. But at the end of the day, the point that she's making, and I guess it's the last point we'll have a chance to make, is we have got to find ways of taking this, these treasure troves of data and make it flow seamlessly across settings of care. It's got to flow with the patient, wherever the patient goes. It's got to be available to them. It's got to be data streams that can connect not only in their own home and their own family, but data streams that can go with them to the clinical delivery system, work with them in the clinical delivery system, and then data streams that follow them in terms of the care management for chronic illness so that it stitches together this panoply of medical and social supports that they have to have. And finally, it's got to stitch together with individuals' families who are trying to be the caregivers for people with chronic illnesses. So all of this data sort of seeps through, but it's always centric now in this new era of digital health. It seeps through at the level of the person as opposed to the delivery system. So I really applaud you for that question. Thank you all so very much. So I guess keep them wanting more. We're definitely keeping people wanting more. Thank you both very much for an amazing conversation. I honestly wish we could go on for another hour. But uh, let's give them a big, 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 big round of applause.